You're listening to The Corbett Report. David Rockefeller, last surviving grandson of oligarch John D. Rockefeller, is dead. We are told he died in his sleep at the age of 101 this past Monday, and with him the third generation of the infamous Rockefeller dynasty, the fourth if you count John D.'s bigamist snake oil selling father, is at an end. So what does it mean? How do we measure the life of someone who has shaped the modern world to such an extent? One measure of a man, some would say, are the friends that he leaves behind. In that regard, consider the people who are now stepping forward to pay tribute to David Rockefeller and his legacy. Like the Clinton crime family. David Rockefeller was a consummate businessman, a great humanitarian, and a serious scholar. He was a kind, good man to all who met him. Hillary and I are grateful for his friendship and his remarkable life and the Bush crime family. So many knew him as one of the most generous philanthropists and brightest points of light, whose caring and commitment to the widest range of worthy causes touched and lifted innumerable lives. David was also very active in national and international affairs, and his connections and keen aptitude for issues made him a valuable advisor to presidents of both parties, yours truly certainly included. And the Council on Foreign Relations crime syndicate, Mr. Rockefeller was the longest-serving member of the council, joining in 1941. He served on the board of directors for 36 years, 15 as chairman. In recognition of Mr. Rockefeller's many intellectual, financial, and leadership contributions, the council's flagship studies program, a world-renowned foreign policy think tank, was named in his honor. As much as the testament of the likes of Bush and Clinton and the CFR, arch-criminals who have left a trail of death and destruction in their wake, tells us about the kind of person Rockefeller was, there is another dictum which seems even more apt. The measure of a man is what he does with power. Surely few men in history have been a steward of such vast wealth and, by extension, held so much power. Chairman and CEO of Chase Manhattan, Chair of the Council on Foreign Relations, founder of the Trilateral Commission, founding member of Bilderberg and advisor to its steering committee. In fact, the dizzying array of banks, corporations, think tanks, foundations, and supranational organizations of which David Rockefeller was a member does not even tell the full story of the power that he wielded. Having learned a valuable lesson about power and wealth from his grandfather, he was always careful to portray himself more as an observer of events, or minor participant in the organizations and movements that he, in fact, founded, funded, and brought to fruition. A special televised meeting of the New York-based Council on Foreign Relations provides a window to the real story. The speaker, Vice President Dick Cheney, takes a question from David Rockefeller. Vice President, um, I just enjoyed so much your whole speech, but I was particularly pleased that you gave such a strong endorsement for the free trade agreement for all the Americas, subject that has been of great concern to me for many years, and particularly recently, and I think it's absolutely essential for the strength of our economy. Rockefeller's role in the drive for an FTAA was a lot more central than he portrays. Rockefeller cultivated Latin American leaders who could be counted on to support such a proposal, Both the 1994 Miami Summit and the FTAA proposal were conceived and nurtured by a Rockefeller-created network. Prominent among the organizations sponsoring the Miami event were the Council of the Americas, founder and honorary chairman David Rockefeller, the Americas Society, chairman David Rockefeller, the Forum of the Americas, founder David Rockefeller, the Institute for International Economics, financial backer and board member David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission, founder and honorary chairman, David Rockefeller. Growing up in the household of John D. Rockefeller Jr., steward of the family fortune and controller of the infamous Rockefeller Foundation, David and his brothers knew from the earliest age that they would be decision-makers nearly without parallel in human history, 
capable of shaping events not only at home, but all around the world. A world that they were eager to divide up amongst themselves. The year 1952 marks the end of the transition from John D. Rockefeller Jr. to his sons. It's from that point on that the sort of the brothers generation uh, begins to have the recognition, visibility, and effective control over things that, that allows them to do the kinds of things they want. The brothers were anxious to have the money, unlike uh, their father, for whom the money had been associated with such um, evil, fraught with such peril. There was a kind of a sense that this money could be used for personal ends now to pursue their professional and social objectives. John D. III continued to run the family philanthropies, but was emerging from his father's shadow through his work in population control and U.S.-Asia relations. Lawrence, who had inherited his grandfather's business touch, was a pioneering venture capitalist. He invested in aviation, new technologies, and built tropical resorts with an eye to conservation. David, the family intellectual, was at age 37 already senior vice president of the Chase Bank and was becoming a champion of urban renewal. Even Winthrop had found an interest of his own. In 1952, he went to Arkansas to divorce Bobo Sears. There, he fell in love with a mountain plateau named Petty Jean and transformed it into a cattle ranch, Winrock Farms. This is my show, he exulted. It doesn't have anything to do with any Rockefeller family project. The Rockefeller most in the public eye, Nelson, was a prominent member of Dwight D. Eisenhower's administration. At once a cold warrior and a social liberal, Nelson bombarded the cautious president with ideas, but they were largely ignored. I've learned one thing, he confided to an associate as he left Washington. You can't have influence in government if you haven't been elected. Nelson returned to New York like an exiled monarch come to retake his throne, in the words of a biographer. Lawrence stepped aside, ceding Nelson the presidency of Rockefeller Center. John reluctantly surrendered control of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Brothers Philanthropy. It was 1956. America stood at the pinnacle of its prestige, and the Rockefellers were the nation's first family, not only of wealth, but also of power. If there was an establishment in America in the 50s, it was these Rockefeller Brothers. These young men have taken their place as these uh, absolutely unique members of a unique family. They're in some sense the very tip of this uh, kind of a, the American century, the American experience, this, this optimism that buoys America in the post-war era. They were in many ways at the center of business life, conservation life, environmental life, political life. They were in the middle of it. That's exactly where they wanted to be, and they loved it. Fifty years after Ida Tarbell's scathing attack on John D. Rockefeller Sr. in McClure's magazine, Fortune magazine published a glowing profile of his grandchildren. Each brother was said to be worth upwards of $100 million. But more important than their wealth, Fortune argued, was the vast social empire which the brothers commanded. From their headquarters in midtown Manhattan, their influence reached into every sphere. Over the years, through the Rockefeller philanthropic enterprises, charities, support of science, their business enterprises, a web had developed which spread out uh, and was interconnected with practically every center of power in, in our country and, and, and abroad as well. So this was the real strength and power of the family going well beyond money alone. 
sometimes they would joke about it. They say, well, David, David gets Europe. Nelson is going to have Latin America. And, uh, you know, uh, John D. the third gets Asia. And then they make some joke about what Winthrop got, you know, which would be something like Arkansas. Uh, but nonetheless, there was something really behind the joke. The Rockefeller clan has never been exactly normal. Not since William Avery Rockefeller, John Dee's father, abandoned the Rockefeller name altogether to take on the persona of Dr. Bill Livingston, celebrated cancer specialist. The name was a ruse, of course, like everything else about William Rockefeller. He was neither a doctor, nor a Livingston, nor a cancer specialist, much less a celebrated one. But the name change became necessary after his years of hawking snake oil, bigamous marriages, and rape finally caught up with him. An itinerant father... There was one thing that Devil Bill, as he was known by his victims, made sure to teach the young John D. Rockefeller, future robber baron. I cheat my boys every chance I get, William Rockefeller once bragged to one of his confidants. I want to make them sharp. I trade with the boys and skin them, and I just beat them every time I can. I want to make them sharp. That selfish fruit never fell far from the Rockefeller tree. And it is a telling sign that David Rockefeller opens his 2002 memoirs with this self-serving tale from his own grandfather's funeral. After the service, as everyone milled about, Mr. Yorty, grandfather's valet, gestured to me. Yorty, a dapper Swiss fellow, had been grandfather's valet and constant companion for 30 years. I knew him well, but he had always been reserved in my presence. I went over to him, and he pulled me aside into a deserted hallway. You know, Mr. David, he began, from as early as I can remember, the staff always addressed us in that way, Mr. Rockefeller being too confusing with so many of us having that name, and first names would have been too familiar. Of all you brothers, your grandfather always thought you were the most like him. I must have looked very surprised. It was the last thing I expected him to say. Yes, he said, you were very much his favorite. I thanked him somewhat awkwardly, but he just waved his hand and said, no, no, I just thought you should know. I didn't really know what to make of it. I thought it would have been Nelson, but I couldn't pretend I wasn't pleased. Even there, writing of the death of his own grandfather some 65 years later, David Rockefeller couldn't resist making the moment about himself and his own rightful place as successor to his grandfather's throne. If nothing else, the Rockefeller household raised the stakes of sibling rivalry to a significant degree. But it wasn't only Rockefeller blood flowing through the veins of David and his brothers. Their mother, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, was the daughter of Senator Nelson Aldrich, one of the most powerful and influential politicians of his age. And then, of course, your mother, and you, you wrote so lovingly about both of them, but your mom was a member of the Aldrich family, and that was, among other things, a very powerful political family. And I know that in my reading and teaching of American history, Senator Aldrich was a major force in America 100 years ago. That's true. He was a senator, United States senator for 33 years and and was the uh, leader of the uh, House for, uh, rather, rather the Speaker of the Senate for a number of those years. So he did play an, an important role uh, in American foreign and domestic policy during that period. Unfortunately, he died as did all, we did three of my four grandparents the year that I was born, so I never met him. But uh, my mother uh, greatly admired him and traveled with him a great deal, and I always uh, felt very proud of what he did in the Senate. David's brief description glosses over the truly central importance of Senator Nelson Aldrich, referred to by many as the general manager of the nation. As a key figure on the influential Senate Finance Committee, Aldrich oversaw the nation's currency. It was in this capacity that he presided over a secretive Jekyll Island conclave with the nation's richest and most powerful banking interests in 1910. As outlined in Century of Enslavement, the history of the Federal Reserve, it was that meeting, undertaken in complete secrecy and hidden from the public until decades after it took place, that eventually gave birth to the Federal Reserve System itself. Indeed, it is in the marriage of John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s wealth and business influence with Abby Aldrich's banking and political influence, that we can best understand the world-conquering dominance of the brothers' generation of the Rockefeller clan. Their entire lives, David and his siblings were enveloped in the cocoon of wealth that came with their Rockefeller-Aldrich heritage. 
never without the assistance of the army of valets, nurses, chambermaids, and servants that were available to attend to their every whim, even their childhood games were played in the secure comfort of luxury. David and his brothers would roller skate up Fifth Avenue to school every morning, closely followed by a chauffeured car in case they got tired. With seemingly no irony or sense of the absurd, young David delivered Thanksgiving food baskets to poor families in Harlem as part of a school project, accompanied by a liveried chauffeur in full uniform who handed him the baskets so he could present them to the poor. It was from within this pampered bubble of unreality that David Rockefeller began to form his understanding of the world and his own place in it. When he went to college, there was no question that he would attend the most elite. He studied English history and literature at Harvard, earning his bachelor's degree in 1936, began his graduate studies in economics at the London School of Economics, and in 1940 completed his PhD at the University of Chicago, the school his grandfather had founded. To the surprise of no one, least of all David himself, the University of Chicago Press dutifully published its founder's grandson's thesis on unused resources and economic waste, and the young heir to the Rockefeller throne was then given a position as a secretary in New York Mayor LaGuardia's office. Pressed on the matter, LaGuardia insisted that David was just one of 60 interns working for him and was given no special treatment. He neglected to mention that this particular intern was given the use of the deputy mayor's office. It was also no surprise that, enlisting in the army in 1943, Rockefeller was promptly promoted to captain and assigned to military intelligence, where he drew on his family's own international network of contacts to set up a political and economic intelligence unit. Um, after finishing school and uh, marrying Peggy in 1940, then you became part of the military during World War II. If I'm not mistaken, weren't you down here briefly in Miami? Uh, I was. As a matter of fact, um, I, after my basic tra training, um, I was sent here uh, to the guard and administrative attachment of uh, and the Latin American intelligence unit that was based in uh, Miami. So I remember my principal responsibility was guarding uh, the uh, property of the Firestone estate where the principal threat, as far as I could see, was falling uh, coconuts. But <laughs> <laughs> luckily I was never hit by one. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, marvelous estate sat where the Fountain Blue is today. In fact, when they built the Fountain Blue in the mid, early to mid-50s, they built it around the estate, then they leveled the that's estate. Right. That's a pretty nice tour of duty, actually. Well, that's true. <laughs> it was. Really. Stationed in North Africa, and eventually France, David again drew on family contacts to set up a military intelligence unit. Predictably, he also used the excuse to secure business opportunities for himself. As he himself relates in his own memoirs, men of my generation often refer to their military service as good or bad. I had a good war. I had been confused and apprehensive at first, but soon learned to adapt and then how to use my newly acquired skills effectively for the benefit of my country. I look back at the warriors as an invaluable training ground and testing place for much that I would do later in my life. Among other things, I discovered the value of building contacts with well-placed individuals as a means of achieving concrete objectives. This would be the beginning of a networking process that I would follow throughout my life. World War II had left tens of millions dead, Europe a smoldering pile of rubble, and much of the world in disarray. But it had taught David Rockefeller about networking, so it was a good war. Unsurprisingly, his key networking opportunity during this period came in the form of his own uncle, Winthrop Aldrich. Uncle Winthrop, as David knew him, was his mother's beloved younger brother and the chairman of Chase National Bank, whose largest shareholder was David's father and which was popularly known as the Rockefeller Family Bank. Winthrop, we are told, just happened to be traveling through Paris right before David was recalled to Washington and offered him a career at the bank. Meanwhile, David's good war was drawing to a close, and his older brothers were busy working to secure a permanent world capital in New York City. Arriving in New York to choose United Nations headquarters, delegates from seven nations are welcomed by Grover Whalen. They must choose a site within the New York or Boston areas. The committee 
three calls on President Truman at the White House before proceeding to inspect locations. The Eastern United States will soon hold the new capital of the world. Nelson Rockefeller, a former member of the U.S. delegation to San Francisco, was appointed by New York City Mayor O'Dwyer to interest the U.N. in building on the 1939 World's Fairgrounds in Flushing Meadow. When the U.N. rejected this proposal, the Rockefeller family considered offering part of their own estate, Pocantico, and adjoining properties for the headquarters site. No decision had been made when the U.N. convened in the fall of 1946. The Rockefeller family was more concerned than ever with bringing the U.N. to New York City. News accounts from the period convey the atmosphere. As the weary delegates of 54 nations prepare to end their meeting, the world takes stock of recent weeks, highlighted by the beginnings of cooperation. Hopeful signs are the unanimously passed resolution on armaments reduction and atomic controls. And there was big news in the last days, as headlines told another story, the gift of a site by John D. Rockefeller Jr. for a permanent world capital in New York. Quickly accepted, the strip along Manhattan's East River is valued at eight and a half million dollars. An ideal site for skyscraper headquarters, the six block area extends from 42nd to 48th Street. The Rockefeller family formally presented its gift to the UN in March of 1947. The future of this country and the lives of our children and our children's children are interwoven with the success of the United Nations. In it, lies the hope of the people of the world. My father considers it a privilege to have had a part in the development of its permanent home. I'm glad to hand you, Mr. Lee, my father's check. Thank you, Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller, Mayor Dwyer, the United Nations extends its sincere thanks to you and to your father for this magnificent uh, gift. We intend to go ahead and create on the East River side a dignified and appropriate headquarters for the United Nations, which will stand for generations to come as a great monument to peace and security. Your family can be proud of its contribution to this cause. Thank you very much. The Rockefeller gift changed the course of history and brought the United Nations to New York City. It is a gift which gave practical and moral support to the young United Nations, thus enabling it to succeed where the League of Nations had failed. It is a gift which furthered the United Nations mission to help save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. In April 1946, while the family was securing the headquarters of their hoped-for global government in New York City, David began his work at Chase as a $3,500 a year assistant manager in the Foreign Department. Almost immediately upon arriving, he began the process of bending the bank toward his will. And just as his brother's will was to promote globalization through the UN, so David's will was to promote globalization through banking. I felt that uh, since American business, in response to the uh, globalization of the world that was already taking place and the move uh, of businesses in our country abroad in order to, to uh, uh, take care of the companies that they were dealing with overseas, and that was becoming a major part of their business, uh, I felt that we couldn't do a good job in taking care of our uh, Amer even American customers unless we had branches overseas. So uh, little by little, uh, over a period of about 30 years, we opened branches and offices in about 50 countries around the world and were represented in other ways um, in many more than that. And of course, this was once something that was a great interest to me, and therefore, I quite frequently would go over uh, to the countries which I thought we should be in and meet with the leaders of the country as well as the business leaders. And th this, of course, is uh, essentially the way that I happened to know as many people as I do around the world. And, and I feel that that was certainly um, the, one of the uh, best things I did for the bank. 
David presents the globalization of the banking industry, a process that he himself spearheaded, as merely a reaction to the needs of the business world. But it is impossible to separate the business interests of his bank from his own business interests, or that of his personal network of family friends. And, as with so much else in David Rockefeller's world, both these business and personal interests converged at the globalist ideology which motivated him throughout his life. Working his way up the ranks of Chase's corporate ladder to eventually become the bank's chairman and CEO, David soon found himself at the heart of world geopolitics, an unofficial emissary from the Rockefeller family and the banking and business interests it represented to the rest of the globe. When Moscow opened its doors to the first American bank since the 1920s, it was to David Rockefeller's chase. When Beijing did the same, allowing the first American bank since 1949, it, too, was opening the door for Rockefeller. When America became embroiled in the Vietnam War, David used the opportunity to open a branch in Saigon. Along the way, David's networking process helped him befriend a rogues gallery of dictators and despots. You also mentioned in here an encounter uh, with Saddam Hussein <clears throat> in Iraq, in Baghdad. Uh, was there anything in that meeting uh, some 20 years ago that would have led you to believe that he'd be playing the role he is today? I don't think so, but uh, in the light of what's happened, it certainly makes it all the more interesting. Uh, I did it actually at the request of Henry Kissinger, who was then Secretary of State. I was going anyway to that part of the world, and Chase had business with the leading uh, commercial bank in uh, Iraq, and mm -hmm. so I was going for that. And he asked me if I would also go to see him to say that he would like to establish closer touch with the regime. He felt that uh, it was important that our two countries uh, communicated more effectively. I did see him, and uh, uh, he was pretty cold, and uh, uh, he said the only way we could... Uh, hope to establish closer relations would be if we would uh, discontinue our support for Israel. Well, mm -hmm. it was not likely that that was going to happen. Right. So it was not a terribly productive <laughs> meeting, although in the height and sight it was certainly an interesting one. In 1973, David Rockefeller penned an ob obituary for communist dictator Mao Zedong, the man personally responsible for more deaths than any other human in history, in which he praised the high moral and community of purpose engendered by Mao's leadership and claimed his bloody dictatorship and slaughter of 60 million of his own citizens to be one of the most important and successful dictatorships in history. The Shah of Iran. Uh, I was rereading before I read your <clears throat> account. Um, the, the book that was written by Bill Shaw, William Shawcross, yes. uh, a whole book about remember. that. Do you have any regrets about that? My main regrets are that, that our country forced him out of office. I think Iran would be better off today had he stayed. It is certainly true that, uh, that he had uh, secret police that did bad things, uh, and so does this administration. Uh, but I think that uh, he saw what needed to be done in Iran in the way of education and health uh, and in many other areas, and he took steps to, to do something about it. A popular joke of the era held that David Rockefeller never ran for president because he didn't want a demotion. There was more truth to that joke than many realized. He was in fact offered the position of Treasury Secretary three times and the chair of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors once, but turned all of these appointments down because he felt he could accomplish his goals more effectively through the bank. But as tireless as Rockefeller was in his pursuit of globalization, personally visiting 103 countries and racking up over 5 million air miles as he amassed a network of no less than 150,000 personal contacts for his Rolodex, David's ambitions were larger than even he could personally oversee. Like any good crime syndicate leader, he would need a capo. And he found the perfect such vessel in Henry Kissinger. And you mentioned, uh, David, um, Henry Kissinger, and I think he first uh, was noticed by the Rockefeller family after he um, wrote a, um, 
a very erudite work on uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear war back in the late 1950s. Nuclear Wilson's and Foreign Policy. Right. Still, yes. and it was then published, and uh, from that time on, he became uh, pretty close to the Rockefeller family. Well, he did. Um, actually, I guess I was the first one who got to know him because uh, he was a member of an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and there was a, a study group at that time that he, as then a uh, young instructor at Harvard, uh, presided at. And uh, it was a, a, a group to study nuclear weapons and foreign policy. And he wrote a book about it based on the study. I was so impressed by him that uh, I introduced him to my brother Nelson, who was then governor in New York and was then considering uh, seeking the presidency of the United States. They became great friends and actually uh, Henry was, became Nelson's foreign policy advisor as long as he was in public life. And I think has, is one of the remarkable international statesmen in the world today. Even 30 years after he was Secretary of State, he is still asked by heads of state when he travels the world uh, for, their, for his advice. It was through Henry Kissinger that David Rockefeller could influence policy no matter who was nominally in charge of the country. When Chase needed to prevent its mining interests in Chile from being nationalized by President Allende, Kissinger was happy to organize the coup that overthrew him. The meeting between the mining company and Kissinger was, of course, set up by David Rockefeller. Only Nixon could go to China, but it was Rockefeller's emissary, Henry Kissinger, who preceded him. And as soon as diplomatic relations were normalized, there was Rockefeller to open Communist China's first American correspondent bank. When Nixon fell, Kissinger survived the fallout and retained his position as national security advisor to Ford. When William Casey, Reagan's campaign manager, was busy arranging the delayed Iranian hostage release for the 1980 October surprise, he was in secret contact with Henry Kissinger, although campaign visitor logs showed that David Rockefeller made a personal visit himself just to make sure. Incredibly, even as late as 2006, a full three decades since leaving official government office, Kissinger was revealed to be secretly advising Bush throughout the Iraq War, with Cheney admitting he talked to Kissinger more than anyone else, and Bush treating him like a member of the family with a standing invitation to call whenever he was coming to Washington. Even more incredibly, in 2016, just after being feted by Obama for his career of spreading Rockefeller globalism for the deep state ruling class, Kissinger met with Trump to tell him what U.S. foreign policy would really be under a Trump administration. So, James, just as we're learning today, as we're taping this, at least here in the States, it's May 18th to me, Trump and Kissinger hold foreign policy huddle in New York. Donald Trump met with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger in New York, the latest in his efforts to strengthen his foreign policy bona fides. Trump's motorcade rolled into Kissinger's home around 3 p.m., where the low-profile meeting lasted about an hour. Trump aides say the presumptive GOP presidential nominee and 92-year-old diplomat have spoken over the phone multiple times, and that Trump requested the face-to-face. -face. Sean, how did the Kissinger meeting go? Can you tell us? Really well. Really well? Yeah, they've known each other for a long time, and uh, they talked about China, Russia, uh, other world hotspots. It was a phenomenal. China, a country you know so much about. Uh, first, Donald Trump has been, uh, he's talked about calling them a currency manipulator immediately. He's talked about being very tough on China. Um, do you think he will maintain that posture from the campaign, or what will he learn about China as he comes into dealing with it? Well, I hope he wouldn't maintain the posture during the campaign, literally. There is the impact of globalization. And I wrote minor things about that earlier. Not enough attention was paid to the fact that it was bound to have winners and losers. And that the losers were bound to try to express themselves in some kind of political reaction. In my view, in the present situation, one has to, one should not insist 
on nailing him into positions that he had taken in the campaign, on which he doesn't insist. If he insists on them, then of course disagreements will will become uh, expressed. But if he develops another program and leaves the question open of what he said in the campaign, one should not make that the decisive element. You're saying very nicely that we should welcome some flip-flops. Of course, Rockefeller and his network did not put all of their globalist eggs in the Kissinger basket. Instead, David Rockefeller was the founder, funder, chairman, director, or board member of a dizzying array of organizations that he used as fronts to advance his business and political agendas around the globe. When he needed to pry open Latin America for Chase, he founded the Council of the Americas. When he wanted to expand NAFTA into a free trade agreement covering the entire Western Hemisphere, he used the Council, as well as a number of other organizations he personally founded and funded, to push for the free trade area of the Americas. When he wanted to shape the reconstruction of Europe in the wake of his good war, he sat on the committee that created the Marshall Plan, which eventually directed $13 billion of U.S. taxpayer money to Rockefeller and his corporate cronies. When he wanted to do the same in Japan, he chaired the Japan Society that his brother had founded. He funneled U.S. trade with the Soviets in the depth of the Cold War through Chase via the U.S.-USSR Trade Council that he founded and directed. And, as always, there were the unimaginable resources of the overlapping family philanthropic organizations whose boards he sat on and whose resources he could direct to benefit his own agenda. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Rockefeller Family Fund, the Rockefeller University, and a host of similar bodies. But there were other, more secretive groups. Groups that Rockefeller helped to found or direct and that draw their membership from the highest reaches of business, finance, government, and even royalty. Groups so secretive that their very existence was denied for decades. Groups like the Council on Foreign Relations. Although the CFR, from its founding in the wake of World War I, had been largely directed by interests connected to J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers had been warm to the Council and its interests from the beginning. The Rockefeller influence on the CFR rose when David joined as a member in the 1940s, and by the time he became the director of the organization in 1970, the takeover was complete. Here is the Council's annual report published in 1978. The organization's membership list names 1,878 members. And the list reads like a who's who in America. Ten CFR members are U.S. Senators. Even more congressmen belong to the organization. Sitting on top of this immensely powerful pyramid as chairman of the board is David Rockefeller. As you can see from this page in the CFR annual report, 284 of its members are U.S. government officials. Any organization which can boast that 284 of its members are U.S. government officials should be well known. Yet most Americans have never even heard of the Council on Foreign Relations. One reason why this is so is that 171 journalists, correspondents, and communications executives are also CFR members, and they don't write about the organization. In fact, CFR members rarely talk about the organization inasmuch as it is an express condition of membership that any disclosure of what goes on at CFR meetings shall be regarded as grounds for termination of membership. Even more secretive and exclusive was the Bilderberg Group, founded in 1954 by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. Meeting annually, the group has brought together the world's richest and most powerful bankers, corporate heads, government officials, and royalty from Europe and North America for the past half century. From the beginning, the conference was an incredibly exclusive affair, and one in which the utmost secrecy was demanded from its participants. Only 73 people attended that first meeting in 1954, including Prince Bernard, several members of parliaments of various European nations, foreign ministers, the former Prime Minister of France, the director of J.P. Morgan, the chairman of Unilever, and other international power players. From within that 73, ten rapporteurs were selected to introduce the talking points on the agenda and lead group discussion, including, of course, David Rockefeller. Over the 63 years of its existence, the group has hosted discussions that have given birth to the European Union, and, later on, the Euro, planned the 1973 oil crisis, and set the timetable for the 2003 invasion of Iraq, amongst many other things. 
The group itself has lived in nearly total obscurity for much of that time, guarded from discovery by the publishers and editors of mainstream media organizations that dutifully complied with the meeting's demand for secrecy from attendees. It wasn't until independent, internet-based media outlets began covering the meetings in recent years that the group was forced to start an official website, and conference minutes and even recordings of the very first Bilderberg meeting have been leaked online. You may wonder why I have asked you to come here. I have in mind a completely frank and open exchange of views, and this is ensured to you, and it is essential for our success there is no verbatim quotation of anybody, and there is no press, so you are quite free to let yourselves go, if I may say so. Although as founding member, rapporteur, and steering committee advisor, David had remarkable control over this, one of the most exclusive and powerful organizations in the world. Remarkably, even that was not good enough for him. Concerned by the lack of Japanese participation in the meetings as Japan grew in economic importance, he lobbied the Bilderberg Conference to begin inviting Japanese members to the meetings. When this was turned down, David promptly started another, equally obscure and equally powerful group, the Trilateral Commission, to fulfill his vision of a North American, European, Japanese conference. And then you created the Trilateral Commission in a sense to develop relationships exactly, with Japan because... and the rest of the world. Uh, I felt very strongly that uh, Japan had become a, a major power in the world and that we culturally had very few relations with them. And it seemed to me that that was a mistake. And so uh, I tried first to persuade uh, the Bilderberg group, which you've been to and know, yes. uh, to include Japan. Uh, but they turned that down and they wanted to stay so the relation with Europe was important and stick to it. So uh, when they turned it down, uh, a group of us uh, uh, started the Trilateral Commission. And it continues today, and you're going to Japan today. in April. Exactly. Although once again David downplays both his role in the Trilateral Commission and its ultimate significance, it is in fact another group of powerful individuals including multiple members of every American presidential administration since its founding in 1973, meeting in nearly total obscurity to push Rockefeller's globalist agenda. Well, the Trilateral Commission, as, as I mentioned, was started in 1973 by David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski. And Brzezinski's book, Between Two Ages, I believe is what really brought Rockefeller to the table to, to, well, at least to pick up Brzezinski as a, as a co-founder of the Trilateral Commission. The subtitle on his book was America's Role in the Technotronic Era. I found out just after I started studying technology that, that what he meant by the technotronic era was essentially technocracy. It's what we have today. You have to go back and read the book to find that out. <clears throat> but when they, when they got into operation, the first thing they did was to uh, put forth a presidential candidate that was, um, of course, remember, they had all the money in the world to put at it, too, with Rockefeller and everybody else around him. Uh, they picked up Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale as vice pre president and vice presidential candidate, got him elected in 1976, the, the pair of them. Carter then proceeded to sweep into office <clears throat> one-third of the membership of the American members of the Trilateral Commission into his top cabinet positions, and a lot of them went into the State Department, too. Um, <clears throat> that was an incredible feat, but it wasn't a political coup in my in my mind. They, and they said that back in those days. Oh no, no, we're not we're not interested in politics. Well, I don't. I really don't think they were. They wanted to get their hands on the economic machinery of the world, and they did that by capturing the United States executive branch. They didn't care about Congress. They didn't care about the judiciary. They only cared about the engine of of economic prosperity, if you will, and that was our government. And so <clears throat> the first uh, U.S. trade representative that was appointed um, to negotiate trade treaties for the president was a member of the Trilateral Commission. In fact, ever since then, there have been uh, 12 different members or 12 different U.S. TRs that have been appointed uh, by the president along the way. That's over a period of long time. Nine of those 12 have been members of the Trilateral Commission. What can you say to that other than the fact that, well – it, it tells you what they were after. 
they wanted to be in a position to have their man negotiating these treaties, like NAFTA and CAFTA and the TPP. The current USTR, Michael Froman, who's who's putting together the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also the Transatlantic coming right behind it, this guy's a member of the Trilateral Commission. When does this stuff stop, you see? Then you have the, the, the situation with the World Bank. The, world, the president of the World Bank is always appointed by our president. That's how, how it's set up at Bretton Woods. Europe gets to pick the IMF head, and so they always pick that. But there have been eight members uh, of the, um, uh, the eight appointees to World Bank since Jimmy Carter. Six of those have been members of the Trout Outer Commission. And I say, well, what's the big deal with the World Bank? Well, the World Bank has been the major engine of globalization around the world. They had it in their pocket the whole time. You just have to ask the question, okay, they, they own that position. They own the World Bank. They own the USTR. They own the executive branch, lock, stock, and barrel by and large. Are they looking out after American interests? You, you know, like – just us in America or, or people in Canada or whatever. I mean, you know, are they looking after our family and our, even a North American continent? No, they're negotiating for themselves. And what are their goals? Well, to, they said originally to create a new international economic order. The Rockefeller Fortune, a worldwide network of contacts, the Chase Bank, CFR, Bilderberg, and the Trilateral Commission. If the measure of a man is what he does with power, then it should be remarkably simple to take the measure of David Rockefeller. So what precisely did he do with all this power? This is no great secret. He made no effort whatsoever to hide his aims or intentions, as he himself freely admitted in his 2002 memoirs. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that is the charge, I stand guilty, and I am proud of it. But the ultimate consolidation of power, the one world government to be ruled, inevitably, by the Rockefellers and their ilk, is only one half of this dark tale. As we shall see in the forthcoming sequel to How Big Oil Conquered the World, the One World Government agenda is not content merely to consolidate that power, but to use it as a weapon against the masses. The intimate relationship between the eugenics movement and the Rockefeller family is a dark and largely uncovered part of its history, but it draws a straight line between the Bureau of Social Hygiene, the Eugenics Record Office, and other organizations funded and promoted by John D. Rockefeller Jr. on the one hand, and John D. Rockefeller III's founding of the Population Council from the offices and officers of the American Eugenics Society on the other. It is the story of a pseudoscientific mania that swept the corridors of power in early 20th century America, a mania that deprived tens of thousands of the most fundamental human right, that of procreation, and sought to deprive them of much more than that, based on nothing more than the assertion that the poor and destitute did not deserve to pass on their genes, or protoplasm, as the early pushers of this pseudoscience called the hereditary mechanism that they had not yet discovered. It is not difficult to see how such a philosophy was inherently flattering to the Rockefellers of the world. The rich and powerful deserved to be rich and powerful by virtue of their very genetic makeup. Who could argue with that? When eugenics was eventually exposed as the pseudoscientific charlatanry that it always was, the adherents to this philosophy, including, of course, John D. Rockefeller III, sought for a more publicly acceptable rebranding of these ideas. They found it in the idea of population control, based yet again on unscientific assertions of overpopulation and its implicit demand to cull the useless eaters of the third world. And, as always... There was David Rockefeller. And John D. Rockefeller III turned to a protege of the Rockefeller family in the early 1970s, who was then the national security advisor to the president, President Nixon, by the name of Henry Kissinger. Perhaps some of you have heard of this gentleman. 
And Kissinger was commissioned to do a top secret study called NSSM 200. It later in the 1990s, this was in 1974, in the 1990s it was finally declassified from top secrecy and people could read what was in there. But it became, on the signature of President Gerald Ford, it became official US government policy for the first time to impose population reduction on what Kissinger called developing countries where they have rapid population growth and rich raw material resources that the West needs to fight the Cold War. Oil, metals, rare earth metals, whatever. So Kissinger argued that these rapid population increases will create population that will demand of their governments that they get a share of the pie, that they have an economic development. Well, what an obscene thing for populations to demand economic development, a good standard of living, uh, adequate food, shelter, and so forth. We can't allow that to happen, so we have to reduce populations. And herein lies the dilemma that we all face. Let me illustrate. Improved public health has caused the world's infant mortality rate to decline by 60% over the last 40 years. In the same period, the world's average life expectancy has increased from 46 years in 1950s to 63 years today. This is a development which, as individuals, we can only applaud. However, the result of these positive measures is a world population that has risen during the same short period of time geometrically to almost six billion people and could easily exceed six billion, eight billion by the year 2020. The negative impact of population growth on all of our planetary ecosystems is becoming appallingly evident. So let us measure the man then on how he used his power. Worse even than the tyrant who openly rules by decree is the manipulator who rules in the shadows. Worse than the miser is the philanthropist who directs his gifts to favor his own interests. Worse than the open enemy of humanity is its false friend. So it should be no surprise then that David Rockefeller has been handsomely rewarded for his lifetime of service to the clique of powerful globalists with whom he and his family have conspired for generations. And the Rockefeller family's commitments to the United Nations did not end with this exceptional gift. It continues to the present day and it is personified by David Rockefeller, whom we honor for his dedication to democratic principle, for his dedication to development, and for his dedication to international peace. David Rockefeller is a gentleman, a statesman, a scholar, and most important, a genuine humanitarian of the likes our nation has rarely seen. Commander, read the citation. The President of the United States of America awards this Presidential Medal of Freedom to David Rockefeller. Through his extensive humanitarian efforts to promote world peace, David Rockefeller has worked to improve lives both at home and abroad. Building on his family's tradition of charitable giving, he has generously supported a wide range of educational, cultural, health, and urban renewal programs. As co-founder of the International Executive Service Corps, he has recognized the duty and responsibility of the private sector to a world in need. His creation of and support for the Trilateral Commission has provided a unique forum for communication and problem solving by world leaders. Philanthropist, businessman, community servant, an exemplary global citizen, David Rockefeller has earned our enduring respect and heartfelt thanks. But even in the light of all of this, there is no victory in David Rockefeller's death. His passing is no cause for celebration. 
David Rockefeller left the world the same way he came into it. Rich beyond compare. Mercilessly cruel. Obsessed only with himself and his own interests. There was no Ebenezer Scrooge moment before he died. No throwing open of the curtain on his lifetime of dirty deeds. No repenting of his ways or undoing of the damage he has done. And there is, of course, no reprieve from the agenda which he furthered. The ideology that he promoted. It rolls on uninterrupted in his absence. Donald Trump mentioned that he had a phone call with you. How, how did that conversation go? Well, I had an opportunity to talk to him about innovation. You know, a lot of his message is, has been about things where uh, he sees things not as, as good as he'd like, but uh, in the same way that President Kennedy, Kennedy talked about the space mission and got the country behind that, I think that whether it's education or stopping epidemics, other health breakthroughs, uh, finishing polio, and in this energy space, there can be a very upbeat message that his administration is going to organize things, get rid of regulatory barriers, and have American leadership through innovation be one of the things that uh, he, he gets behind. And uh, of course, my whole career has been along those lines. And uh, he was interested in listening uh, to that, and I'm sure there'll be further conversation. No, David Rockefeller's death is no cause for celebration. But there is something worth celebrating. The people who are rising up across the globe to identify and expose the David Rockefellers of the world. The increasingly energized masses who are learning about the CFR, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the works of these so-called philanthropists, the real agenda of these global governmental organizations. Those citizen journalists who, armed with nothing more than a camera and an internet connection, are pulling back the curtain and revealing the Wizard of Oz for what he truly is. Rockefellers, come back. We don't want your new world order, you know? Leave Chile right now. Leave Chile. You are not... You're, you're killing a lot of people! You're killing a lot of people! Live here! Live Chile right now! Live Chile! Live Chile! We don't want your world government! Live Chile right now! Live Chile, okay? Live Chile! Your family! Your family is the most disgusting in the world, you know? Rockefeller, we know what you're doing! We know what you're doing to the world! Rockefeller, your new world order will never come in! You're running out of time! Scumbag! You've rushed it! You screwed up! You're not going to stop the Irish Rockefeller, you scumbag! We are the Irish! We know what you're we up to! We know what you're up to, Rockefeller! One, two, three! <laughs> Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Rockefeller! Happy birthday to you! You can run on for a long time You can run on for a long time You can run on for a long time But sooner or later God will cut you down Sooner or later God will cut you down Go tell that long tongue liar Go tell that midnight rider the Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support. I have now something else to thank you for, David. I've been wondering how we could get this ceremony out into the popular consciousness. And with the mention and the citation of the Trilateral Commission, I know we're going to be on talk radio all over America today. So thank you very much.